Uh, the next speaker are, well, you might know him already. He's a London-based developer. Actually, he's been coming to Finland every now and then uh, because of the React Finland conference that we had. He was speaking uh, at the first React Finland in 2018. Then he's been MC in a few other React Finland conferences, and now he's doing both at Future Frontend. So, Let, what was it? Uh, Eurotrust, Ken Wheeler. Stage is yours. Thank you. It's true. I, I haven't spoken at this conference for many years. I haven't, in fact, spoken in many conferences all uh, for a few years. And I think the, the reason is that I just haven't had anything that interesting to say. Um, I've been a web developer for close to 20 years now. I'm 37 years old, so if you do the math, it means I've been a web developer longer than I was a person before I became a web developer. So at this point, you know, like my identity is a little tied to this whole, whole mess. Um, and one of the reasons I haven't been excited is that when you do something long enough, you sort of start to become a little aware of the ways that we start to repeat ourselves. You start to see sort of like the brickwork behind the facade of the things that you do, so to speak. Um, and for web development, it really seems that we're just rearranging rectangles on screens in different ways. Sometimes we make it a little bit faster and we make it more complicated, then we make it too complicated and then we make it simpler. Um, and I think it's great. You know, web is a, is a really powerful platform. I love the web the way that you can connect people, um, but it just has stopped sort of like fueling my sort of like personal fire. And one of the reasons is that it's not always that interesting to just think about how can we do the things that we do today better. Um, and it's been a while since I've been able to really ask myself the question, what does some new technology allow us to do that we couldn't do before? Um, and that's uh, what I want to talk about. So when I started thinking about this, um, I thought, you know, what do I care about? What is it that we can now build with these new AI tools that we couldn't build before? Um, I love reading, I love writing. Um, in fact, I went to a uh, university to study literature just across the street here in Fabian in Kato at the University of Helsinki. I didn't study computer science at all. I've always been fascinated by stories, and I've always wondered, why haven't we as technologists been able to come up with a way to make writing stories easier? Uh, other art forms have tools that allow people to sort of use technology to, in a way that like understands the medium. You know, photographers have Lightroom, you know, there's Photoshop for visual arts, et cetera, et cetera. But beyond Microsoft Word, there hasn't really you know, been anything that makes writing, especially narrative storytelling, easier. And one of the reasons that we haven't been able to build these tools is the language has been firmly in the domain of humans. Computers are really good at some things, like math and memory. Uh, those are the things that our squishy meat brains are not that good at. But computers have also been really bad at language. This has been something that you know, has been you know, very human. It is. It defines almost like humanity in a way, like language, the way we communicate, the way, way we tell stories, allows us to learn together. But it's not really something that uh, technology has been able to sort of do. And now with these new AI models, I wanted to ask questions like, what can we actually do to make technology more human by using natural language? And this is what I'm talking to you about today. Um, so yeah, my name is Jani Evakalli, as has been mentioned a couple of times. I'm a software engineer, I'm uh, almost a writer. Um, in the last year and a half, I've had the opportunity to basically work on this pretty much full time. I call it an experiment. Um, it's been a, an interesting experiment where we've built software that allows humans and machines to co-create. Um, I want to give sort of a couple of shout outs. So I've been working with Ryan Bauman, who's a, a, a designer who's designed the beautiful app that you're about to see. Uh, and also he's a literary editor. And also Jeff Elmore, uh, who is a machine learning researcher, an AI specialist, uh, but he's also an artist. And if you see this beautiful um, AI-generated um, art that you know, we have on the slides, um, that's all Jeff, basically. So let me show you this app. Uh, you'll see a lot of text during this presentation. You don't need to read all the text. This is just what the user interface of the app is. So we built this thing that allows writers to write, but in a way that understands you know, the actual sort of like structure of fiction, your characters, but it can also give you suggestions in a way that like reads the text and gives you uh, feedback in a way that a human editor would. If you get, for example, blocked on something, you don't really know what the next word should be, you can ask the AI to sort of help you within the context of your story uh, to maybe fill in a little bit. Um, you know, you can sort of like ask it, you know, to make perhaps the text that you've written uh, slightly different. 
And the, the important bit here isn't you know, all of the features of the application, but the idea here is that this is co-creation. This is not trying to replace the human writer, human creativity with a machine, having a machine write a story for us. This is an experiment in how do we work together uh, with these new tools. Um, so this story will be a story in three acts. Um, you will start with just a little bit of AI. This is not an AI talk, this is a UI talk, so we'll focus mainly on, on part two. And then, because this is a programming conference, we'll look a little bit about you know, how do we actually build these from like a front-end engineering perspective. So I'm not a big fan of the term AI. Um, I think one of the reasons is that it just like captured so much of like popular imagination. Like whether your reference board for AI comes from sci-fi or it comes from thread bros on Twitter or it comes from you know, whatever it is, it's just like this overloaded term. There's this old joke, or old saying is that when you're selling something, it's called AI, and when you're hiring, it's called machine learning, and when you're doing it, it's called linear algebra. Um, and I just don't like this term. But what we're really talking about in the context of this is, is large language models, which are just new types of AI models that we've all, I'm sure, seen. Um, there's many implementations of these. Uh, I made these slides a few months ago for a different conference, so this list is already out of date. But you know, on, on a high level, um, mainly these large language models are available either as API service providers or increasingly as open source models that you can run on your own machine. If we look at the most you know, common or the most well-known um, model, which is GPT, GPT-3, 4, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, what these models actually do is that they, you know, their intention is to generate, is to create something to basically to, to be able to um, answer questions. Um, they, they're based on this transformer architecture that was developed at Google. Um, I don't claim to particularly, particularly well actually understand um, how the actual algorithm works. But the, the sort of really big sort of innovation here is that they are pre-trained. They are pre-trained with basically all of world's information you can say. Now, not every model is. But you know these sort of like lar very large models are, and what that means is that you know not only you know do these models have a certain conception of all, you know all the facts on the internet, for example, but they have gained a sort of like a simulac simulacrum of understanding of what human language is like by essentially learning for everything that has been ever written and put on the internet. Um, and this is really interesting because previously the big sort of problem I think with like a lot of machine learning applications was that you need a lot of specialist knowledge in order to train a model. You know, you need massive sets of data, you need to encode some human process into the model. Um, but now the way we can use these models is essentially to just prompt them. And um, by prompting, I, I mean essentially engage with the model in human language um, and get an answer. Now, there's this term called prompt engineering, which I'm sure that many of you have heard, which I, is not a term that I, I particularly like, because finally we have an ability to talk to a computer as if we were talking to another human. I don't think we need to sort of, I don't know, disintermediate. I don't think we need to make it more complicated. Yes, obviously, when you start building production systems, you know, you get into a situation where there is engineering involved. But fundamentally, you know, the, 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 the idea here is that we can ask computers things in natural language. Um, the UI that most of you have seen, you know, is of course JetGPT. Could I just have a show of hand? Who here has used JetGPT? Or can I actually have a show of hands who hasn't? Okay, okay, okay. So there, there's, there, there's a few. I'd be curious to know why. Uh, maybe we can talk about that in the, in the Q&A. Um, Again, you don't need to read all of the text. This is just the demonstration of the chat. Um, but you know, the, the very short you know, sort of like point here is that because I am able to ask it questions, how does it know how to answer? Well, there's two parts to this. One of them is that it happens to be a curious feature of human language that a question is often followed by an answer. So when you complete a question, you complete it with an answer. But then furthermore, you know, these models such as ChatGPT have been trained with sort of human reinforcement feedback to make it more helpful, uh, make it more likely to give you the type of answers that you need. But JetGPT is actually, like when you think about you know, the, the power of these models, I think JetGPT is actually kind of crap. It's not a particularly useful you know, tool, and I'll get into why that is. But before we get that, what are these things? Are they you know, just versatile completing machines that can complete a sentence for us? What qualities do they actually have? Are they creative? Are they factual? Are they accurate? Are they reliable? Can they reason 
like, like a human being? And the answer to all of these questions is like, eh, maybe, but not really, right? But what is creativity? You know, like when two humans collaborate, you know, like creativity is the spark that happens in a person when an other person, you know, gives them some sort of feedback or some sort of input. And uh, in, in that sense, I think these machines can, uh, can sort of enable creativity because they can give you an input or a spark or something that then creates creativity in you. So the thesis here is that I think we can create really interesting systems by thinking of AI systems as a participant in a collaboration rather than a robot or a slave that we make to do tasks. Um, so to go back to this title of this talk, what does it actually mean to collaborate with such a machine? Is collaborate even the word? Like, is there, I, I don't know. We'll explore this in act two. Uh, everybody still with me? Everybody kind of following? All right, good. Um, so we've identified adverb. We've identified a few different modes of collaboration, a few different UI, UX paradigms that you can sort of, you know, think about when you think about building natural language interfaces using large language models. And here I want you to do a little Jedi mind trick and think about maybe different types of software, not just fiction writing software or not even just text writing software, but maybe the software that you're working on or maybe the software that Tero just showed us where, you know, like, you know, he's uh, going through and like adding reverb and things. What if you just tell the machine, hey, can we add some reverb? It can go find the package, do the thing. Um, is that taking anything away from Tero's creativity? No, it just makes him do less button pushy, finicky things. Now, obviously there is incredible joy in writing code, incredible joy in like twiddling with things like this craft. But you know, fundamentally here, you, know, you can kind of think about it as like, how do people who, you, your, who use your software or the software that you haven't even dreamt of building yet, how can they interact with that um, better? So we've seen chat. Um, again, you don't need to read the text here. Uh, but you know, chat is interesting because chat is a form of collaboration. It's like a meeting. But it's like a meeting where the other person does not know what the meeting is about and they have not prepared for it at all, which also happens in corporate life, you know, fairly frequently. Um, and obviously you can enhance chat with context, you know, like you can bring, um, you know, more of the information of the thing that you're working on into chat. But, you know, fundamentally, you know, it's, it's a really powerful mechanism to say, yes, that's great, but can we do it differently? But fundamentally, you are still working outside of the flow of the thing that you're doing. Um, so what happens if we bring functionality into context? So here I'm reading a little bit of text. So who are you, he asked, and then I'm asking it to describe her realization. Now, who is she? What is she realizing? What is she reacting to? Um, this is where we've brought, you know, essentially this very same completion mechanism with actually fairly light prompting in this case um, to, to into the context of your work. And then we have this little notion style interface where you just do slash describe or whatever, um, but you don't need to leave the flow of your work, whatever you were doing, but you have access to this thing that already knows the thing and the place that you were working on. Um, but you can also make it do tasks. So one of the things that chat is really annoying about is that you, you're always working on sort of like creating something new. You know, take that and make it, you know, different. Um, but here, you know, you can actually ask the machine to do tasks on the data that you already have in your system. You know, oh, um, how about you take this, uh, this, this music diagram and you just make it nice and balanced looking so I can work with it better, a little refactoring. Um, you know, and th this, is, this is really interesting and really powerful. Um, but the most interesting part for me is this idea of sort of like an agentive um, AIs that are able to do things in the background for you. Because like, like I said, we don't necessarily want to think about this as like a robot or a slave or something that just does things for you. Um, but maybe something that works with you or collaborates with you. So if you're in a Google Doc, you know, you're in a Zoom call and you're working on a document, it would be really annoying to have to ask the other person, hey, can you go and edit that paragraph and change it like that? Um, what does it look like when the person is actually sort of understand the general work you're doing and is able to um, sort of contribute to it? And how do we actually build those user experiences? So this is, you know, maybe the sort of like the meatiest uh, slide that we're going to get to, but don't worry, we're going to go through these one by one. So in the work that we've been doing uh, with Ryan, our designer, um, and by the way, about 50,000 people who have used this software, hundreds of them who have talked with, uh, many of them serious writers who have spent hundreds of hours writing in this software, 
we've sort of refined this user interface um, to a point where we feel like it sort of fulfills this feeling that you're collaborating with something. And I'm using something very specifically. I'm not using someone because you know, I think we can have a separate conversation about the identity and agency of, of these things. So one by one. We already talked about inflow, you know, just making sure that these functionality is available in the context of work that you're you know, working on. You've already seen this, nothing new, but this is the first principle. Um, the second thing is that these you know, operations need to be fast. So one of the things that LLMs, at least the current hardware requirements and current sort of model architectures, they are slow. Not slow as in like minutes, but you know, it will take multiple seconds for it to generate a paragraph of text. If you have a few second wait, this gets really, 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 really old really fast. And this is where you start to lose the sense that you're actually working with something and you're just waiting on something. So all of these, because these um, you know, models are token completion models, so they basically provide answer token by token by token. Uh, if the API or the way that you access your API um, uh, supports streaming, you can actually just um, stream the response in, into the application as it's happening. And you can also, by the way, do this for structured data as well. You can ask me how later. Um, there's some fun tricks to this. Um, making it context aware. Again, like we you just have the example of her reaction this time, not her realization. You, if you need to tell the model or you need to tell the AI what is it that you know, like is, is happening, what is this data, you know, what are my other documents, um, what is the sort of like uh, the code base that I'm I'm working in, um, that again like breaks the illusion of you're working with something intelligent. Um, so like making sure that the context in which you uh, do operations is, is sort of explicitly um, included. Another thing of these things is that they, you know, while they are reliable, well, actually, they're not really reliable, but why they, why they produce sort of like when prompted well, uh, produce usually good out outcomes, um, they don't always get it right. So making these things sort of like very easy to go like, no, not like that, give me another one. Um, so making these um, sort of operations rewritable is, is something that we found really useful. Uh, similarly, making them tweakable. So like sometimes it gets it's almost just so. And now you could go and you know edit the thing that it created um, by yourself, and totally you know fine. Um, but fundamentally, again, that takes you out of the flow, and you become sort of like a, like a, you are now the person who, are, who is being given tasks you know to do something, whereas you can just essentially ask the AI or the model. Um, to tweak the thing that it, um, that it created. Um, making things reviewable as well. So every time you're actually going and you're editing something that the user created themselves, there's always a risk of losing data. And that's very distressing from a psychological perspective. What did it do? What just happened? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so making sure that every time that you are sort of uh, changing something that you know, the user uh, created themselves um, to allow the user the possibility to go Oh yeah, that looks good, or that doesn't look good. Um, the other way that you can do that, I mean, in our case we do both, is making sure that these things are undoable. And this is of course like very normal practice in, in good software, but unlike you know, typical input fields, um, you know, sort of larger operations where like maybe more complex data is being operated on, like undo doesn't come out of the box, so you need to make sure to build it into the system. But the biggest, I think, change in my thinking in about how to think about user interfaces has been, you know, become sort of like really comfortable with this idea of having your software be operated or instructed by natural language. And what I mean by this is that, for example, here in this example, I believe we are asking it to make something more, make it less romantic, right? So if you think of like a, from a classical user sort of interface design point of view, um, things are usually buttons or drop downs. There are multiple options, like you know, multiple choices. There might be a slider. So could we have a romanticness slider in our application? Absolutely, we could. You could have a little setting screen where you can go, oh, this is how romantic I want things. But this is really difficult because honestly, you're just then constraining the user to use the software the way that you, the designer, thought about it should be used. Um, and this, you know, is great um, because that allows you to sort of like help people discover types of functionality, et cetera, et cetera. But also like prevents the user from, you know, really engaging um, with the software, sort of like fulfilling that desire. And in design, you know, in urban design, there's this concept of desire lines. You know, when somewhere isn't a road or a path, but people want to walk on it, they will walk on the grass, and that leaves a little brown patch of, you know, beaten grass. This is kind of like the way of of allowing users to 
sort of walk wherever they want on the grass. But then if you collect data, you collect analytics, you sort of even ask an AI to summarize maybe what are the most common operations people are doing, that's how you discover the desire lines of what are the functionalities that your users actually want to do in your application. And what we ended up then doing is that we found, for example, um, people want to shorten or lengthen things. So eventually we added a short and lengthen buttons just to make them very explicit and, and easy to use. But this is not something that we sort of a priori decided that people should be doing. We discovered this by letting our users you know, use the application the way that they wanted, uh, and then we just made it easier for them. Um, this is, this takes a little getting used to this idea, but I swear to God, it is so incredibly powerful when you actually start thinking about it. Um, but we talked about natural language input. Um, the other problem where, where, where this gets a little bit more tricky is the natural language output. So. When you typically interface with some kind of an API, well, actually, let me just run this slide first. So, you know, natural language output is very flexible. It's very powerful. It's very intuitive. You know, you can read whatever it gives you. Um, but it's also, you know, not regular. You know, it's not sort of context-free from like a mathematical point of view, but it's also not parsable in the same way. It's not structured data in the same way that you think of, uh, you know, data typically being. And yes, there are ways to coerce LLMs to return JSON or, or YAML or whatever it is. Uh, but fundamentally, even the individual content of the field then becomes a free text, and you may, you know, may want to constrain it in some cases to be a part of, you know, like uh, with some kind of schema of like these are the valid values. But when we think about enabling users to sort of like work, for example, in free form documents or, or something like that, um, it becomes somewhat tricky to sort of like think about it as like how do we actually go and, uh, and build the UI for it. And I'll tell you why. And this is where we get into the third part, uh, JavaScript. So I started this talk by saying that most websites are, you know, just start to feel like they're just uh, rectangles, you know, rearranging rectangles in different ways, um, foreshadowing. Um, so I think this is true. Uh, divs, rectangles, spans, inline rectangles, you know, images, rectangles with pixels, Videos, rectangles with moving pixels. Inputs, rectangles that you can type into. You know, like fundamentally, you know, this is the kind of shape of user interfaces and very good reason, right? You know, not only does it make sense in a rectangular screen and like in the kind of like, you know, two-dimensional coordinate systems that we typically work with to make things um, structured this way, but it's also the way data is structured, right? So, you know, let's say that we have structured data. Um, it's typically very, very easy to bind that into a UI by saying this data goes here, Sometimes you do a little munging, maybe you would have a full name field so you concatenate two things, but you know, like you are essentially binding data into something. And similarly with lists, you know, you have an array of data and you make a list of rectangles. And this is, you know, how all of our tools are based. This is, um, you know, some React code, JSX code, but it doesn't really matter what framework or what sort of templating language you're using, you know, fundamentally they all work pretty much the same way. And these tools that we have are fantastic. You know, like something like React is really good at taking a list of things, and then when you change the data, to finding where to insert um, the thing in between, right? Like the UI framework takes care, care of most of the UI updating, and we can just get these benefits that we're so used to. Like, you know, so we just take it for granted, like declarative uh, data binding, you know, just making your applications reflect the, the state of the, the truth. But the problem is that natural language is, is somewhat squishy. It doesn't like, really have that same sort of you know, structure. And while you could try to coerce your model and data into this, I think it's interesting to think about, is there a framework for efficiently working with natural language interfaces? Like, how do we actually build these systems? And this is something where I feel like we had to you know, do it wrong a few times in order to get it right. Um, and I wish that this could be a moment where I drop some magical AI UI library or whatever, but no, we, we kind of uh, found the tools that we needed already in the world. Um, so let me show you a little bit about how our app you know, typically works. It's a user, it's an app. It's a normal React app, it's built in TypeScript, it uses a um, text editor called ProseMirror. Um, nothing much to be you know, said about it, pretty boring, simple. Some performance issues with long text, but you know, like pretty simple overall. Now, this app talks to uh, BFF, a backend for front end. So basically, this is just like an API that you know, it talks to. It could say an API, but I changed it because people thought that I meant like an open AI API. So this is just my you know, way of saying there's some sort of a backend. 
That backend writes all of the text into some sort of a database. Uh, from there, we have these background agentive sort of like process, like you're basically not even agentive. They just literally read all of the text that you just wrote and then run it through different pipelines of different AI models in order to extract information about it. Who are the characters in this um, part of the story? You know, what are their dynamics? What are their relationships? You know, et cetera, et cetera. We put all that information in a database. Again, this is a different database because it's a semantic search database. So it could be something like Elasticsearch, but with these new sort of sentence, sentence transformer models, um, you have more specialized tools. We use something called Pinecone, but there's about you know 100 of these. Um, WeV8 is nice to, to look at. But fundamentally, it's just a searchable database where you can do a natural language search and say, hey, give me, you know, for this particular input, this particular request, her reaction in this context, give me the most relevant information about you know, who is she, what is she reacting to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we have these agentive AI bots that are essentially able to operate on that information and then feed that response back into the API or into the, into the backend. They can do this synchronously-ish in the sense that, like, you know, they can respond to user need, but they can also do this sort of, like, asynchronously where they can go and, like, provide suggestions when you least expect it. So what is this magical... BFF that we built, uh, you know, is this Node? Is this I don't know Next.js? Is this PHP? Like, what did what did we you know what, what what server software you know is particularly well suited for this sort of problem of multiple parties cooperating on a single document all at once? Because if you think about the requirements, you need um, you know I'm writing, and then also the AI is editing the same document. There's lag, there's delay. We want to make sure that we keep this thing uh, consistent. Uh, this thing can be asynchronously updated over the batch, you know, like at night, and I need to be able to reconcile those changes to whatever changes I made while I was offline. You know, like this gets kind of interesting. Um, but we don't really use a server as such. Instead, we use a data structure. Um, there's a particularly interesting kind of data structure called a CRDT, or a conflict-free replicated data type. Um, can I have a show of hands who has heard about CRDTs? Okay, that's more than any other conference I've spoken to it this year, so good, good on you, Finland. Um, CRDTs are this really interesting um, sort of like a data type that has a really interesting property, which is that they allow multiple clients to update the same document. It could be text or structured data, uh, anything that can be really represented as a map or a list or a tree, um, and guarantee that the resulting document always ends up in a consistent state in real time or asynchronously no matter how many concurrent editors you have in the document at the same time. And so now this is interesting because this kind of fulfills all of our requirements and also ends up writing very little code because we don't actually have to write almost any backend code at all. Um, there's a great implementation for JavaScript. Uh, there are many implementations of CRDTs in different programming languages. We use one called YJS. Um, and YJS is essentially just like a nicely packaged uh, CRDT that, that also has a syncing layer, so it like it syncs into text editors um, like ours, but you can write your own sync layer for any uh, any data structure. It provides things that we needed, like offline supports, um, et cetera, yada, yada, yada. It was just a really convenient package. There's also many problems with YJS. I'm not saying it's the perfect panacea solution for everything, but it's a really nice library for this kind of thing. And we don't really look at, need to look at code a lot, but just very, very briefly, you know, you essentially create a document you can put any data in it if you want. This is a to-do list, so we have a, you know array of to-dos, et cetera. And then we can observe on it, and every time that we insert or delete data on it, it updates, but it up updates across all of the clients that are connected to it, whether on the client, whether on the server, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there's nice abstractions for it. Like, for example, you use this library called SyncStore that makes it look very much like MobX, so you can use it in your React code. You basically just state to-dos push with your thing, and then eventually every connected client, now or later, will get this data. But it also ensures that things happen in the right order. Um, but yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm going on and on. But one thing that's interesting, actually, a uh, tie-in for tomorrow's talk, we deploy this server on a platform called PartyKit, which is, uh, there's a talk about it tomorrow, so please do tune in. And PartyKit runs it on Cloudflare Workers, and we have two whole sessions about edge computing uh, and Cloudflare Workers tomorrow, so I think this is a... Uh, very much something that you know we think about is you know a good sort of approach for software development in the future. But if we now look at you know what we can do with this <clears throat> is you know we can 
have, you know, the AI can join the chat. Now, this is not actually something that we do in our app. We don't actually model the AI as a user like we do here in this, this demo. And that's for a number of reasons. I don't think we want you know, users to feel like somebody else is writing their document. I don't think we want to actually like, inscribe these sort of like human uh, characteristics to it. But you know, this is something that you can do. And so if we go back and we look at this architecture, one thing that immediately jumps to me, at least, is that we've actually created a system that supports not only human AI collaboration, but also supports human human collaboration. This is, in fact, what CRDTs are created for. Um, and this is when we talk about collaborating between human and a machine. It gets really interesting because what are you really collaborating with except the sort of like uh, complete works of humanity encoded into a, into a machine, right? Like it's just intermediated collaboration with, with something that packages uh, the information for you. So here, for example, you know, we have multiple editors, uh, Ryan, Jeff, and myself editing the same document. Uh, while the AI can be reading everything that we, we write and also can participate in the, in the collaboration session. And so <clears throat> when I, oh, I'm missing a slide here, weird. Uh, I guess we'll have to pause on this slide, unfortunately. Um, I started this by saying I'm hopeful that maybe we can create software that is more human, uh, than the kind of software that we've created. And I think in our particular case, the experiment has definitely shown that it, it can be. But it's not only creating software that allows humans and machines to collaborate, but when you also allow humans to collaborate, you're creating essentially, well, I mean, connection, collaboration, right? And this is just a really, really good way of building software, whether or not you're building AI systems, right? Like when you think about your user's needs, how much fun is it to be able to do things together with somebody, you know? Like the music demo that was just so, hey, I'm really enjoying jamming on this. Would you like to jump on this thing and do it together with me? If we build software in this way, do, not only do we make it sort of like really easy to integrate sort of AI participants into this conversation, but we also just create software that is overall sort of more, um, more human. Shit, I had a really good last slide here. Uh, it's. Uh, we, ha we have to present from Taro's computer because AB problems and somehow it got disappeared. Um, I guess what I want to say is I'm not sure about this whole AI thing, right? Like my heart has been broken many enough times by potentially interesting technologies that then turn out to be, you know, highly disappointing, you know, the trough of disillusionment and so forth and so forth. But there is undeniably something here that I just don't think that we can ignore. Um, you know, we'll hopefully soon talk about what does this mean for us as software developers, but I think fundamentally, I think we'd be shooting ourselves and our users in our collective feet if we didn't at least explore how is it that, you know, we can use these models to create better software. Now, there's many, many reasons why you might not want to do this. There's ethical um, problems with the way that these models currently have been sourced, you know, the way that there's, for example, artists work in there that has not been... Um, sort of credited or compensated or asked consent for. <clears throat> so like there, there are problems, but I think these are problems with our current implementations of these models, right? Like just because we make a large language model doesn't need to be, it means that it needs to be unethically sourced. I think we can create AI models <clears throat> that are sort of built with credit compensation and consent in mind. And the way that we, for the time being, need to kind of think about this is that it's on us, you know, the people who actually built the software to decide what is it the right thing for us to do. So for example, the feature that gets most requested in our little app is, can, we, can I just ask it to write in the style of my favorite author? And now there's perfectly good use cases for things like fan fiction, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but it gets into this problem that those artists did not actually decide to be part of that data set that the model was fed on. So we have not built that feature. We will not build that feature. Um, because we don't believe that is the right thing to do. So that's just like a one small active way in which we say, I think we do need to participate in this discourse at large. I think we do want to explore what does it mean for humans and machines to collaborate, but we get to choose how we do it. And like, it's a very weird moral gray area. And I think overall we have the capability of making it better. Not by training, not only by training better models, but also just being sort of like active human participant in the process of creating software. Um, that's all for me, thank you.